point. All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to our illustrious gatherings. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. We'll have a few brief announcements. Then what we'll do is we'll have some, then our speaker will speak up to about an hour or so. And you'll take questions. And then after the question and answer period, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where uh, each and everybody can speak for a certain specified period of time, usually about two to three, maybe four or five minutes, depending on who has rebuttals. And uh, we re generally wrap up about nine o'clock or so. We'll get the best last word in. But uh, Mike, I hope you're ready to present. Otherwise, I'm going to have Charlie now go into our announcements period. So Charlie, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right. Welcome, everyone to meeting number 3,646 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay. Um, first of all, we have a Google email group, which I recommend you sign up for. It's right there at the top center. Uh, to get up notices by email of upcoming programs. We also have, uh, if you look a little lower, a meetup group. And you only get one or two messages per week, no traffic, uh, alerting you as to what the programs are going to be. So I recommend each of those, either one of those or both uh, to be alerted. Uh, as to upcoming programs. Now, don't, although I am not a capitalist. Don't forget about our Facebook page, Charlie. We're also there too. Yeah, um, we also have a Facebook page as well. And uh, it's up Expertly right now. Expertly maintained by me <laughs> with wonderful <laughs> illustrations. <laughs> also, okay, uh, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming program. We have 10, 10 of them, upcoming programs on a variety of subjects, all of which I maintain are important and things we should know about. On December the 18th, Reverend Charlie Earp will be telling us about his Church of the Revolution, which involves intersectional eco-socialist Religious communism should be a good religious evenings are always interesting evenings. Uh, we break for the holidays and then return on January the 8th with America Walks, pedestrian advocacy. And uh, we'll be talking about high tech automobiles as well. Um, the uh, development of these uh, driverless cars and things like that. Okay, January the 8th, January the 15th, the Libertarian Party will be returning to tell us to disavow all forms of government. So January the 15th, the Libertarians will be back here. The topic will be too much or too little government. January the 22nd, a new organization, uh, actually based out of New York, uh, called the Just Society, and uh, they have, and they get involved in transit issues as well, but they have a national campaign, uh, and you are all for justice, I presume, and against injustice, so really, this should be a good, good, uh, good evening. On January the 29th, the farm workers uh, will be pre uh, presenting us, they have some pro this will be a bilingual program with Spanish trans translators. Uh, we'll be hearing from farm workers telling us their experiences in providing food to the people of the United States and the working conditions that they have to endure. On February the 5th, we're going to take a look at the Democratic Party, what they're doing right and what they are doing wrong. So if you want to go after the Dems, that's your evening. The president and the Democrats, an assessment of uh, this administration 
and that party. On February the 12th, I just had a meeting today. This is really interesting. The Illinois Green Party is going to have a referendum in Chicago on, on, on climate change, as well as you can have referendums around the state of Illinois. Uh, they're putting together a platform of candidates as well, but primarily uh, it's talking about you can put an initiative on the ballot where you live if you have townships in Chicago. By the way, the Chicago Green Party will be looking for committee persons for each of the 50 wards. So if you want to serve in that capacity, um, keep in touch with me. And uh, you can become a committee person of the Green Party uh, in Chicago. Uh, let's see what else going on. February the 19th, we're going to get into foreign affairs. This should be an intriguing evening. Don't have but enough. Stansfield Smith is going to be returning and give us a detailed analysis of what's going down in Venezuela and the U.S. war on this country that he will detail. So that's February the 26th. Usually gives a very informative presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, 19th, rather. Okay, That's the wrong. 19th, we're at the stand. Yeah, I got the date wrong. It's and the, the 26th 19th. is the next open date, right? Yeah, so I, I have made a mistake. Look at that okay, publicly. No, big deal. Okay, so I keep going. Shame. All right, on March the 5th, uh, Dan will be telling us all about food and water and concerns we should have about getting food and water and laws uh, to see to it that we have enough to eat and drink. So it should be a good good evening. He's usually well-researched. On March the 12th, we're going to go to another country, this time Nicaragua, Los Sandinistas. Uh, so we're going to be looking at what's going on in there Libertad, politicos, right. So that should be a good evening. Okay, that's about it. The next open date, dates are February 26th or March 19th, if you'd like to speak. Thank you, Tim. Take it away. All right. Um, don't forget, we do have a Dallas campus too that meets on Thursdays at the college and they're their schedule is um, also, listen, if you take a look there, we do have, a, I'm not sure where the link's at right now, but the Texas campus is always looking for speakers and they have um, uh, on Thursday, December 9th, uh, I'm sorry, on December. They haven't 16th, scheduled anyone yet for that December, day. But... I mean, on the, the 16th, they got uh, another uh, open meeting, but, you know, they're always, uh, uh, they always have somebody in there. So if you want to speak and uh, get them on a Thursday, just contact Tom Barry or John Beasley, and they'll be more than happy to uh, to help you guys out. All right. With that, um, I'm going to uh, now turn it over to our speaker. So, Mike, uh, you got the next hour or so. So uh, take it away and tell us a little bit about yourself, about your program, and uh, let's get started. Again, I'm asking everybody to mute themselves for the speaker's program so he can give a thing and then we'll unmute when we get into our question and answer period. I'll stay unmuted, but I'll also have a, I do have a, on my microphone, I do have a switch that turns it on, turns my sound on and off. Okay, so Mike, if you're ready, go ahead. The platform I, is yours. I am ready. Is the voice coming out clear? Is my voice coming out clear? Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, it's okay. Try again, Mike. Well, Every time. Fuzzy. Is it better yeah. now? Yes, uh, a little better now. <laughs> okay. it, uh, that's good to know. Well, it's good to be here on your show. And I know they, I've been a part of College of Complexes for almost, I, I would say, about eight to nine years now. We used to meet at a Pizza Hut place in Dallas, Texas, where original I am from. But now we are doing all the virtual meetings. It's so good to be connected with Tom and Charles here. My topic, Tim is talking with your enemies. How do we do that? What do we do that? Let me share a few thoughts. 
Mother Teresa is my mentor. She had said, if you want to talk, if you want to make peace with your enemies, she says, go talk with them. Talking among ourselves will not change one bit. And that has been my inspiration. And that has caused me to deal with, I wouldn't call them enemies, but people who are opposed to everything you do. Like Sean Hannity on Fox News. Uh, I have been, I was on his show for about seven years as a commentator. He and I butted heads all the times. But Mother Teresa motivated me that I should deal with him. Because if I don't talk with him, who will, ever, who will talk with him? If everybody backs off from talking with the enemies or perceived enemies, or people who are difficult, then who will talk and who will bring solutions? So Mother Teresa has my motivation and she got me into doing this business of talking with the enemies. Honestly, I don't consider them to be enemies. I consider what Jesus said, Forgive them, Lord, for they know not. They know not. That's the reason they behave and act like that. And that's, I take that, and I take it my responsibility, Tony, uh, Tim, sorry, to see what I can do on my part. If I can share the information that is available to me, if it makes sense to them, well, if it doesn't make sense, that's all right. But we have to go talk to them. I'll share a few examples of how this came about. In the next uh, month or so, we're still failing to get some people. What's happening in the Senate and uh, with, between the Republicans and Democrats with one person making a real difference? It is very humbling that as an Americans, we are the most advanced nation on the earth. We are the nation that brings, make things happen, but we are not making things happen. It is an embarrassment that the senators on both sides are sticking to their guns rather than seeing what is good for America. They need to, and also on, on the part of Biden, he needs to compromise on certain issues. Not everything he wants is what all Americans want. He got only about 51% of the votes. The other 49% don't. So he needs to learn to work with them as well. We need to respect every American who holds a different view. So to try to find solution to this dilemma with the senators, we are setting up here two groups. I'm taking a bus load of about 20 people from Washington, DC. They're not from Washington, DC. There are two from Dallas and two from uh, different cities. 10 of us are going to go to a staunch Republican center in West Virginia, where everyone, almost everyone voted for uh, President Trump. We want to have dinner with them, talk with them, see what is going on. Why is that we cannot agree on certain basic things? We disagree on some key issues so that but why can't we agree on most of the issues? Let me share an example with uh, Matt Schlapp. He's the chairman of the uh, Conservative Union, which holds annual meetings with the extreme conservative right-wing Republicans. I attend those meetings. I'm independent, by the way. I attend those meetings to understand their point of view. I can't have just one perspective and make decisions or opine on issues because it would be incomplete. It would be half ass uh, opinion. For an opinion to be full, I have to incorporate all different uh, thoughts into that. So I attend a CPAC meeting every year. I sat down for three days in a row. All you hear is you have heard some of them clips. I'm sure some of you who are Democrats don't go to those meetings and I advise <laughs> try to go there. But you don't go there because all that you hear is putting down Democrats, putting down everybody in the earth, bombing Iran, bombing things, destroying. It's all about destruction, nothing about constructions. 
So I told Matt, Matt, do you really honestly want Democrats to listen to your point of view? The conservative Republicans? Matt Schlapp said, yes, we do. Then quit talking like this. You sit down on the society in the audience side. What you hear is a lot of your bull. Nobody wants to hear that nonsense. If you really want Democrats to hear your point of view, listen, tone down your rhetoric. Don't put them down. Bring the issues and focus on the issues and you will find some commonalities on some issues and some you don't. So he said, well, what we can do, uh, this is what our audience want. This is a rally here, a conservative union rally, and this is what we do. Uh, we cannot have a reason and logic here. Matt, why don't I join you? He has offered me that he will consider, consider me to speak uh, in the planning committee of the conservative union. I'm not a conservative, nor I'm a total progressive, I'm a, I'm a moderate. I said, we want to tone down the rhetoric. We ask the speakers to, with the one point of view that your ideas, you should sell it to the Democrats. And the same thing goes to the Democrats, sell your ideas to the Republicans so they can understand. Then you can come together. Instead of selling, you're taking a complete opposing stand. When you take a stand like that, there is no, there's always going to be controversy. This is the problem with the senators. I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed about our senators. They're just going to the party line like little sheep, little goat. You can hurt them. They don't have common sense, God-given brains to use. They don't use their brains. To them, party is more important than the nation. Party is more important than the country. This has got to change. So we are going to go to West Virginia to talk with a group, a bunch of people and see what is it that can bring us together. How do we talk with our enemies? Are they really our enemies? Are the people who we differ with? I'll give you an example of Joe Grizzly. Joe Grizzly is a big burly guy, 6'4", big beard, bandanas, and all kinds of tattoos, like the motorbike guy. I was standing in the lobby at the CPAC meeting. Joe walks in. He walks in and he looks at me and puts his hand on his face and walks away. And I didn't understand that, why he was doing that. So I ran back to him. I said, why were you running away? He said, I hate you. He says in my face, I hate you. And I said, why do you hate me? I said, I don't want to talk to you. Just go away from me. And I said, no, I'm not going here until you tell me if you don't like my face, there is nothing I can do about it. If you don't like my height, nothing I can do about it. If you don't like my color or my voice, I cannot do anything about it. If there is anything I can do, talk to me about it. I'll change. He looked at me and said, I hate you because you disagree with Sean Hannity. And I said, okay, what's your name? He says, uh, Joe Grizzly. Joe, does your wife, your children agree with you? He says, no, they don't. Then I said, tell me, why should I agree with, why should I agree with Sean Hannity then? He thought it for a moment. Then what happened was I had a piece of paper typed three small paragraphs in Trumpian language. That is a second, second grade child, child's language. So Trump can understand. The letter said, Dear Mr. Trump, on your inaugural address, please tell Americans, fellow Americans, I will not tolerate any American harassing, lynching any fellow Americans. If you do it, I'm going to punish you. I'm, I'm for all Americans. And then I cited him. There were 19, uh, 119 Jewish cemeteries were desecrated at that time. Two mosques were raised to ground in Brownsville, Texas. And two Indian fellows and a apparently Hindu temple was also torched in Kansas. I cited those and I wanted him to read it. First, he refused to read. Then he grabbed the piece of paper for me. 
give me that paper, I will read it. I gave the paper to him. He read the paper. After he reading the paper, I told him I'm going to videotape this Joe. He agreed to be videotaped. We videotaped and then I said to him, Joe, what do you think about this? He said, I think Mr. Trump should read it too. I said, okay, now tell me what should you and I do? You claim to be a conservative. I don't claim to be a conservative. Now do I claim to be a liberal that you malign? I'm a moderate. What should we do to come together? Him, you will not believe what Joe said. Mike, I get your point. We conservative needs to be a little soft. We need to come towards, a little bit towards the center. If you come towards the center, I said, I'm willing to come to the center, are you? He said, yes. We shook hands, then we said bye, and he put that video on his uh, 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 Twitter account. Then Matt Schlapp comes, he's the chairman of the, he reads the letter. He said, I'm going to give this letter to Mr. Trump. I said, please do. And I taped him, videotaped him, just, just so he's not BSing me. Next day, Matt Schlapp comes back into the hall again. I said, Matt, did you give the letter to the president? He said, yes, I did. I still didn't quite believe he really gave it. The next day, the second night or the third night was President, Vice President Pence was speaking. I said, as, as soon as he finished his speech, as he was walking out of the stage, remember it is a very tight security. Nobody can get to him. I dashed, the security guy was trying to hold me. I said, no, no, I have this letter to go to Trump and I need to give this to him. And uh, Pence looked at me and he said, he nodded his head. I went and gave the letter. And I said, sir, this is for you as well as Mr. Trump, the president. He took it. Finally, on that day on the inaugural address, addressing both the houses, Trump's first three lines came out of that letter. Uh, so my friends, talking with the enemies, there is a chance. If you don't talk with them, you have zero chance of bringing any change. But talking with them, at least you have 0.1% chance. And that's what Mother Teresa means talk with them and uh, they are not bad people they seem to be bad people deep down they are not the second thing that motivated me to take this approach to talk with the enemies is a verse from the quran verse 41 34 it says good and evil are never equal good and evil are never equal repel evil with good he says, you will never know the person whom you thought your bitterest enemy could become your best friend. Treat them right, even if they treat you wrong. That is the words from the Quran. And I use that all the times. No matter who curses me, whether I get death threats, whatever it is, I treat them well. Hospitality, and that changes people's mind. As Jesus said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not. And I also share one more example about uh, repelling evil, where, uh, re repel evil with good. It's happened so many times. And also Mahatma Gandhi had said, if you want to make a change, be a part of it. Something to that effect. We cannot sit here and bitch about changing the world changing the house, changing the Congress, Senate, and do nothing about it. Just talk in coffee shop. We need to be a part of it and do something about it to bring about a change. Well, then Sean Hannity, going back to Sean Hannity again, he bashed the Quran every night on his show for many, many years. I got on his show but I did not try to change him immediately because we were, in, we were in conflict from the very beginning. So it took me about three years working with Sean. On the fourth year, I talked to 
took a copy of the Quran, sat down with him, and I said, Sean, you said, kill the infidels wherever you find them. I said, yeah, that's what the Quran says. Sean Hannity said, okay, let me, this is what they hear. This is what you hear from Robert Spencer. This is what you hear from other people. Read the Quran. I opened the page to him. It does say, kill the infidels wherever you find them. Then I said, Sean, read three verses before and three verses afterwards. He reads, if somebody comes to evict you from your own home, tell them to stop. If they still come at you, ask them to stop. If they still jump at you, chase them. If they go hide in the bushes, find them wherever you find them and kill them. But if they say, I am sorry, I shouldn't have done this. I repent, I regret, extend the hand of friendship to them. Don't be aggressive towards them anymore. And that, Sean said, he looked at my face up and down. Is this what it means? It doesn't mean kill the infidels. If there is a formula here, if somebody tries to evict you from your home, then you give them the warning. If they still don't hear, you chase them. But if they still regret it, you give them the freedom. You give them friendship. Then from that day forward, he quit bashing the Quran. And this is the guy who hated the Quran, who bashed Quran for many, many, many years. My, my children, Charles and Tim, Tim, my children, in the first year of Hannity, they called me and said, Dad, please get off Hannity. Don't be on his show. He humiliates you. He humiliates you. We cannot bear it. We cannot see my dad getting humiliated like that. And I say, I told him to my daughter and son, kids, this is what my calling is. That is, talk with the enemies. Deal with them. There may be chance. If I don't talk, there is no change. After one year, when they saw, after three years, when they saw the changes, they said, Dad, it was worth the humiliation. I said, it was not worth it, but I'm glad it happened because I took the humili humility in return for good. And that's what Mother Teresa had said. And that's what the Quran had said. Stuart Warney, for example, he was uh, number two on Fox News. I was in his show for about 15 times. I was with uh, everybody on Fox News. He used the word Muslim terrorist all the times. And I said, Stuart, please don't use the word Muslim terrorist. I said, what should I use? He said, use terrorists among Muslims. He asked, why should I use that? I said, look, you are in New York. If your niece is coming from Portland, Oregon, I was in Dallas at that time. She calls you, Uncle Stuart Warney, I'm thinking of moving to Dallas or New York. Where should I move to? Obviously, you say, my niece, come to New York. But when she calls me, I said, no, you don't go to New York. They're rapists. New Yorkers are rapists. I'm having trouble. And here. Stuart jumped at me and said, what do you mean by that? I said, there were 2,000, 2,200 20, rapes. You know what? Never mind. I'll put in earplugs. It's just too, he's too intense for me. It's all right. Okay, sorry. I'll turn down. Uh, Stuart, when he said, uh, Stuart said, uh, why should I? Our lady should mute herself. That's what the deal is. I just, uh, I just muted Arlene. lane. We'll be, I just muted Arlene. So uh, we go ahead and continue, Mike. I'll tone down. Okay. Stuart, when he said, why should, why do you, why do you say I'm, uh, all the New Yorkers are rapists? I said, look, there are 2,200 rapes last in, in New York. 700 rapes in Dallas. Where should I recommend your niece to go to? You guys are terror rapists. He says, no, we are not. We are. We have some rapists, but New Yorkers are not rapists. Exactly my point. 
There are terrorists among Muslims, but Muslims are not terrorists. He changed his tone after several years of calling Muslim terrorists. He quit saying Muslim terrorists. So these are the things we can do. I, then Laura Ingram also did, so Greg Gutfeld, and uh, many people are struggling with this. Another story is, I was uh, in October 2015. There were gun-toting fellow Americans. I'm not going to call them gun-toting extremists. I will call them gun-toting fellow Americans made a declaration that they are going to stage with their guns and rifles and EIK-15s in front of 19 mosques, including one in Washington, D.C., one in Phoenix, Arizona, and all over the country. The Muslim organizations gathered up in Washington, D.C. They decided, well, we are not going to deal with them. We will close the mosque on Fridays. We'll shut the mosque down for Friday sermons. We will not uh, open the mosque. Let them come and do whatever they want, and uh, we we'll stay home. I shut up. Uh, Keith Ellison, you know, he is the uh, Attorney General for Minnesota now, but he was a congressman at one time. Keith Ellison said, Keith, I want to speak. He said, what is it? I said, this is an opportunity. I said, what do you mean? When the Catholics came to America, they had to endure the humiliation for, I don't know, 100 years, 50 years, whatever. The Baptists had to endure. The Italians, the Irish, everyone, the Jewish people, everybody had to endure humiliation for a long time. Now, these guys, the gun-toting fellow Americans, are short fusing it. They're giving us an opportunity to cut short for the Muslims. When they come with their guns, don't close the mosque. Keep the mosque open. Put the tables in front of the mosque. Put water bottles and have some hot dogs. When they come uh -huh. with their attitude that these Muslim guys are going to fight with us, we're going to shoot them. That is their mindset. Fox News had built them up with. They will come there. When they come there, you give them water. You work there. You invite them. Give them hot dogs. Play the American music. Fly the American flags. What do they think they will do? All of a sudden, these guys came with an attitude of fighting, arguing with them. But all of a sudden, they see the hospitality, they will change their mind. So all the Muslim organization, all the major Muslim organization, about 30 of them, and I was representing my center for pluralism. We all agreed that we should keep the mosque open and serve water. And I said, okay. The next day I wrote a press release release it to about 110 newspapers. Guess what? Those guys who are going to come with their guns decided, hey, we cannot tease these guys. They're not going to fight with us. They're going to be good to us. Let's not go there anymore. They canceled their whole program. It was in October 2015. So these are some of the examples I'm shared uh, from one range to the other range of talking with the enemies, dealing with the enemies. I believe I have taken the full hour or maybe at least 50 minutes and uh, I will um, open up to any questions or up to you. Uh, Charles and Tim, however you want to do, I'm ready. All right, so let's now, uh, all right, unmute yourselves. Uh, Arlene, I did mute you, I believe. And uh, I think if you're on a phone, it's star six. Um, so, you know, please unmute and uh, let's get some questions going. All right. My first one to you is uh, I'd like to, Mike, how did you get involved with this foundation? And uh, tell us a little bit about why you started it, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. I was an atheist for 30 years of my life. And when I lived in Dallas, at that time, I had a radio show and I had a TV show in Dallas. And everybody in the town knew me. And uh, the biggest thing in Dallas at that time was called Thanksgiving Square. It is the biggest thing in Dallas. It's before 9-11, before even the interfaith started. So everybody said, Mike, you should join this group because you talk about all religions. 
all the traditions you should join. I said, okay, I joined. I filled the application for 35 bucks, joined. And the next day, uh, the Baha'i was the president. Baha'i guy was the president of the organization. He called me back and said, Mike, I got some bad news for you. I said, what is it, Kevin? He said, well, we can't have you uh, in the Thanksgiving Square. I said, why? He said, we don't have a pigeonhole for you. We don't have a pigeonhole for you. I said, what do you mean? Well, if you are an A, if you are a Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, we have a space for you. We didn't have a space for atheist. It was in 1996, uh, uh, Tim, and I said, heck with you. I'm going to form an organization called Pluralism. And every American, regardless of what they believe, what they look, what they practice, they are Americans and they will have a seat on the table at the foundation for pluralism. That's what got into it. And from there, I got deeper and deeper and we formed the, reformed this called Center for Pluralism. It is an IRS approved 501c3k organization. We have very clear goals. <clears throat> Number one, pluralism in religion. Let me define what pluralism. It is respecting the otherness of the other. You are who you are, I am who I am. I don't need to compromise with you, but I need to learn to live with you. Pluralism in religion, politics, society. Society is what you eat, how you eat, what you wear is your business. It doesn't affect me, whatever you wear. <coughs> then the workplace, then human rights and religious freedom. This is the scope of our work. And we do a lot of workshops and we do a lot of uh, uh, on religion workshops and politics. Mm -hmm. And one of the politics we are doing is going to West Virginia to bring Republicans and Democrats together to talk. What can we do? How can we proceed forward? So that's what we do. And that's how the Center for Pluralism came into being. Uh, and uh, almost everyone in Washington DC and many people in Chicago know our work. Uh, centerforpluralism.com is the website and you see hundreds of articles. Um, and uh, one of the other things we do, Tim, is when we live as neighbors, when I live on the same street as you do, I live in the same town or state as you do, it behooves for me to learn a little bit about you. Mm -hmm. So what we do is every festival, Rosh Hashanah, um, Christmas, Easter, Muslim holidays, Hindu holidays, Jewish holidays, and any holiday that comes out in about 400 words, I write the essence of that festival. So the people who are not Jew, for example, for Rosh Hashanah, how do the Jewish, non-Jewish people should get a glimpse of what Rosh Hashanah is? What is Easter to Muslims, Hindus, and others? So the more we learn about each other, the less conflicts we will have. So that is another thing we do. And uh, you can see, if you just Google search, for example, Easter, you will see about 25 articles, me actually attending the Easter mass. And I also took a dip where Jesus was taken, baptized in the River yeah. Jordan. And uh, because I want to feel that feeling of every religion. And that's what you, if you put my name and put any religion, any festival, I wouldn't say all festivals, major festivals, you will find the essence of it. So that's how I came to find the Center for Pluralism. This is my passion. I had a big, I was a home builder for many years and I have a doctorate uh, in uh, divinity and I have two master's degrees. I left all of that, sold my home, came to DC to establish the center so I can bring about a change at least I don't want to go away from the world receiving, receiving the same. I want to give something back to my country. And uh, we have three anchor events called the 9-11 Unity Day. We bring people of every American we reach out to, to come together to rededicate our pledge. Thanksgiving Day. And also we have uh, uh, Holocaust and genocide. Uh, this is the first time ever in the history of uh, uh, Jewish people a Muslim started the Holocaust and genocide event for the general public, whereas Holocaust Yom HaShoah is uh, commemorated uh, in synagogues, but now we do it in public for all people. 
We bring people from all faiths so all of us can learn the tragedy of Holocaust and learn to say no, learn to see the signs of genocide and how we can do on our part to stop it. So that's about me and my organization, Tim. All right. Well, thanks. Margaret, you got your hand up on mute and ask the next question. Sure. I wanted to know about that Thanksgiving Square. Is that was that a government owned place that that people were in or I mean, what do people have tables and talk or what? Thanksgiving Square was found by some two philanthropists It's a private entity. It's not a government owned. It's not thanks to the good government. Private entity, a few philanthropists got together and felt the need that as our population is growing in the different Christians, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, we need to have a table to come together and have a dinner together. And that's how it started. Okay. It's a just, big, big okay. institution in Dallas. Ah, I was just going to say, if it was a government, if it had government money, they, they would have had to been required by law to give you a space. But uh, apparently that's not what it was. Oh. No. Okay. All right. All right. Who's next on the questions? We got more. We got open. Uh, so nobody's got their hand up. Uh, come on, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll go with a, a, a different question then. Go ahead, Margaret. Um, Charlie will be next after you. Then. I, oh, okay. I, um, I, it, it boggles my mind when I think about the Republicans like uh, what was it, her Bobbert and Marjorie Green or whatever, the people that want to kill me and you, mm -hmm. point in fact, and who are so irrational. Yes. That, you know, how do you, I, 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 you can't even talk to them. You really cannot. I don't think so. I mean, I certainly would not be able to. Well, let's, uh, Margaret, give, me, give us a chance. We're going to go sit down and talk with them. Uh, in uh, in West Virginia, and that would be a model to bring it to the Senate. Uh, a rabbi, myself, and a pastor are working the Senate angle. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm not saying we will succeed, but we have had success. We have had failures. All we can do is make an effort with Marjorie, and I think she's a very difficult person. But uh, maybe because nobody had given her time. Uh, maybe we have we need to hear what she has got to say, why she is, if she has got legitimate fears, can we address them? If she has got phobias, can we address them? Uh, but it takes a lot of time. Like they say, to have friendship, you have to smell the roses or something like that. We have to listen to her first for her to listen to us. Uh, since you put that challenge, let me make an effort to reach her out and said, I want to have lunch with her and see if she will give me the time. If she does give me the time, I want to honestly ask her, we are all Americans. We all want to live without fear. What can you contribute towards that? Or if, if you think Democrats are doing something wrong, what is it precisely that is wrong, that is not good? All we can do is try. Okay, Charlie, you got the next question. Then we'll go with that. Yeah, Mike, uh, I have a loony neighbor. Uh, he doesn't believe in gun control. Always. Always. And she is a police. And uh, he's got a stockpile of weapons. Jeez. And he said he's ready in case BLM shows, Black Lives show up. Could you recommend how I approach this individual in any, if that's possible? Well, it is, it is possible. There is a guy by name, I'm trying to think his name. I can't think of his name offhand. Uh, he's a black African-American guy who reached out to the KKK and he has many white KKK extremist friends on his on board with him who are changing their attitude towards black people. Oh. Uh, uh, let me find out the book and send it to you, Charles, so you can share with uh, them. That book is worth reading it. And he has got some good, solid, concrete ideas. But yes, what you can tell your friends is, uh, you are ready to kill, are you ready to go to jail for it? If you are willing to go to jail, are willing to get shot, why do you want to waste life? It is a God-given life. 
you shouldn't take your life nor take anybody's life. Uh, what is the exact precise problem we have? The Black Lives Matter is born out of some perceived or real injustice to them. Why don't we address them? When we address them that, they may not have that. The intensity of their uh, protest may go down. Uh, so it's, it's, it's always a dialogue, Charles. Okay, who's next on the questions? Uh, Ricky, did you raise your hand and had one? Yeah, um, I'm a little confused on the topic here. The title was given as talking with difficult people. Yes. Which to me meant people who are so neurotic they can't have a give and take conversation or they talk nonstop and they don't really give you a chance to get in. Or I, I really viewed it from a psychological point of view. But then you, Mike, mentioned uh, talking with your enemies. And yet it seems to me more like talking with folks that disagree with you. Is that it? I, <laughs> I, well, it's uh, uh, Vicky, I think it's uh, my mistake. I understood. Uh, I have two topics, talking with difficult people as well as talking with the enemies. I, I thought this program was next Saturday. I had it on my computer as next Saturday. When oh. Charles called me, I said I jumped at it and uh, I pulled whatever point I had and uh, it was a similar topic. I got this. Uh, oh. I will talk about talking with difficult people some other time. Well, oh, I like that. Yes. Why don't you? Uh, why don't you give us a brief synopsis of it, real quick? Uh, I mean, because your pluralism and getting a, and, and talking with some difficult people might aren't they kind of like one and the same in a lot of ways? Like listen and that type of stuff. Yes, it is talking with difficult people. Are these people don't even want to hear you? They're constantly talking, as uh, Margaret had said, and they. Uh, this is one sided. They are not hearing you out. They're just talking, talking, talking. How do you get ideas into them? How do you see that they listen to you? And uh, there are some practical ways of doing it. And again, the very basic is again, first listening to them, bringing, looks like a Vicky, maybe a psychologist, or, uh, and she, she might be able to better tell that. But sometimes when you listen to people, and bring some clarity to their own thinking. For example, is this what you said? Is this what you meant? And this is, no, 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 this is not what I meant. And you get them to narrow down. When they narrow down, then you have a topic to talk about. Then you can address the issue. Uh, but it is a very difficult process, especially if they are our family members, our uncles, aunts, grandfather. Some of them are very difficult because they come with the idea that I am the authority they have to listen to me. So it's it's difficult to talk with difficult people, but it can be done. Uh, let me put the whole program together and uh, talk about it next time. But doesn't, but doesn't like some of your enemies can be, are the same type of things like you were talking about Sean Hannity earlier. Identical. And, and, you know, and, and, and some of the methodology you use for Sean Hannity and, and Trump, wouldn't they apply to some of your, like your family members who are completely disagree with you and just think they're the authority on everything? Yes, fully agree with you. They're very similar. They're, they're, they're running in parallel. Same, so lot, same. Go ahead. So a lot of what you're saying tonight is to deal with difficult people and, and talking to your enemies also can be done with those loved ones who you think are just being... We are just know-it-alls, right? Exactly, exactly. You, you nailed it. Did I, did I, Vicky, did we, did we answer your question pretty much? Vic, unmute, Vicky. Did we, did we, did we, did we click it? Well, clear? I still want to hear the whole thing. Oh, so, all right, Vicky. More. I will yeah. put the program together okay. and talk to Charles and see when is the next slot available. Right, uh, Charlie, what do you think? Well, Thank you. February is a good time to do it. We might want to hear from you again on this topic. Okay. All right, uh, who's next on the questions? Uh, Charlie, uh, I don't know, you already went, didn't you? Okay, Peter, why don't, I know you got something in you with the question, so please go ahead. 
You're looking at me? I'm looking at you, Peter. You're oh, right. Tim. No, I'm just happy to see everybody brave the the cold night and uh, stay home uh, to catch this most important principle going back to Thomas Jefferson, pluralism. And, and uh, I still think uh, we are one of the most pluralistic cultures in the world, but that is deteriorating and that frightens me uh, that a principle that so many people came here to find uh, is eroding and uh, that's, that's a sad commentary and I hope we can reverse some of the damage done during the Trump years and uh, even earlier than that. I'm encouraged if the KKK is opening their hearts. That's whatever <laughs> someone said that, and I'm 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 pleased for uh, the holidays that we've got that to dwell on that point. Yes, but it's good to see everyone. Yes, I will. Thank you. I will certainly send a copy of the uh, front page of the book and as well as the author and where it is available to Charles. It's a book mm -hmm. worth reading for Christmas. All right, Charlie's got his hand up. So, Charlie, please go ahead again. I'm yeah, if no one's got any questions. Uh, sir, a few years ago, uh, there was a concept floating around, quite popular among the lefties, called multiculturalism. Yeah. And it basically meant that you shouldn't make judgments uh, or or regarding other cultures or ethnic groups or I guess racial groups. Uh, however, I don't perceive anything wrong, sir, with applying ethical standards to a culture or a religion. Certainly there are elements of either a culture or, oh, there's many cultures in the world that have practices, which I will just say should be discouraged or disbanded altogether. Think of our own Western culture, some of the concepts that were prominent over time, which we have discarded, hierarchy and authority, uh, the treatment of women, uh, differentiation of racism, uh, other than the white spe uh, speciation or the status. Uh, are you advancing that we apply no ethical, and we have a philosophy group as well, and we often discuss ethics. It's one of the pillars of philosophy. And you're saying I should not apply ethical standards. They have some sort of immunity, religions, no, uh, the, the human rights is the, the key basis for all societies. And as you have rightly pointed out, Charles, all societies, if you look at our own Western society, I, I watch a lot of Western movies. And I, if you guys, the guy who walks into the bar, if somebody looks at you in the wrong way, he gets shot. That was our culture here too. We have advanced far. In the Middle East, for example, Saudi Arabia had the extremist culture and they have made reforms just in the last six months, they made some major reforms. And in Texas, we still have the death penalty and we still have uh, some old ways of doing things. The entire society is moving towards pluralism. Uh, we are much more pluralistic the world today than 100 years ago where people did not tolerate, a Protestant didn't tolerate a Catholic, one Muslim did not tolerate others, that was there. But today, we are more acceptance of each other. And we are not there, we are not a perfect union, but we are getting there. Um, who else has a question uh, for it? Ileana is a good time to ask. Bob, you got stuff up here. I know you guys are... It's not exactly our, our, our uh, you know, divisive topics all the time. You know, I remember um, when I go to my church on Sunday morning, it's a Baptist church, and I've also been taking parents to, my parents to Catholic. Like, what are your teachings on, a, like it says, Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, 
Uh, can you give us your comments on, on, on that kind of uh, philosophy with your Center for Pluralism and just kind of tell me what you think about those things? Yes. Jesus, peace be upon him, he was there to create uh, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is where no human being, nobody that God has created, of course, everyone is created by God, has to live in fear, apprehension, or tension. Loving thy enemies, the message of Jesus, meaning uh, they're really not your enemies. By loving your enemies, you have a chance of bringing them into your fold. If you call them enemies and push them, they dig in their heels. That is not what you want to create in a kingdom of heaven. You want all people to come to peace and not some people dig in their heels. If you call them enemies and they dig in their heels and you fight with them, they will fight back with you. Then where, how does the kingdom of heaven come about? So this message of Jesus is very profound when he talks about love the enemy and forgive your enemies or forgive those is a very powerful between loving and forgiving the world can be a very peaceful and harmonious society and we can build a very cohesive society just based on those two principles uh, Tim and uh, yes uh, I'm a big fan of Jesus and of course you worship him but I revere him I admire him and I consider him my mentor because those are the things and uh, what was the other one he said on the uh, be, uh, Mount uh, Beatitude? Yes, to be yeah. peace. Yeah, the peace. Uh, peace uh, peacemakers are those. Forgot the word. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yes, it means okay. it's a very powerful statement because peacemakers create kingdom of heaven for everyone. Okay, then we'll go to Margaret, then we'll go to Eliana, okay? Well, Eliana is, hasn't had a question, and I have. And Eliana, go ahead and ask your question then. You're well, next. I don't know if it's question or, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Okay, I don't know if it's question or just small, small comment. Actually, I hear you very, I pay attention to what you said, and I kind of agree with you in general. Uh, but uh, no buts, everybody different and everybody have different temper and approach to the, you know, to different people. But what I agree with you, uh, sometimes people need to compromise, uh, just sometimes, and not create no conflicts or, you know, or that environment. Because, you know, I believe in energy very much and... Uh, I believe in more, of course, more positive energy. Uh, you know, so I agree kind of what you said. People need to not create, like I said, not create a conflict situation and sometimes tolerate, but sometimes not, you know? Yes, yes. Right? But in general, I kind of agree with what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, when it comes to justice, we shouldn't compromise. But yes. again, there is a room for little compromise but if it brings peace to everybody. Yeah, yeah. not a bad idea. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Margaret, I guess you're next if you got something, so go ahead. Yeah, um, I am with the people who, um, uh, I'm past progressive. I'm with the people who feel that a significant part of the Republican party are willing to set up a fascist dictatorship, a white, male, Christian, fascist government here. And I see a lot of that. Um, and that's been a long time coming, a long time planning from uh, the 1960s or the 1950s. And, um, and, and so those people, and, and that was the people who came to the, who were in Charlottesville and said, the Jews shall not replace us, or I, I shouldn't say shall, they probably didn't say shall. The Jews will not replace us. Um, and the people who um, invaded the Capitol and were willing to murder people, the only reason that people escaped, including the Republicans that later denied what was happening, 
they, they were within seconds and minutes sometimes of being killed, of being murdered, including Pence. They had a scaffolding out front for Pence. Yeah. So uh, Bob is telling me I'm a bleeding heart liberal, so I yeah, will um, refrain from being nasty to him. All right. Um, so at any rate, uh, okay. <laughs> at any rate, um, so people who have that agenda in mind, and I'm firmly, con and I've been convinced because I've seen documentation of recruiting within the fundamentalist of evangelical churches, of uh, using uh, the, the, after the, the racists in the South could, not, could no longer get tax money for their white segregationist uh, academies, and from everybody, tax money to support these academies that that uh, would only have white children, and they they wouldn't admit any black children or any uh, or anybody from another religion besides Christian. And currently, the people who are in the Supreme Court uh. asking that money, tax money, be used to support church-run schools that deny, uh, deny admittance and deny employment to people who are LGBTQA people. You know, so they're, they're actively and openly discriminating against a group of people. They are, they are using their religious freedom to deny human and civil rights to people. And so all of this is part of a thing to set up this white male Christian patriarchal fascist government. So if you don't toe the line, you're in trouble. Can I share something with you, Margaret? Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> the, the, the church attendance, especially uh, extreme right evangelical churches is declining for one single reason. The children, the youth attending, they cannot tolerate what the pastor says. Many churches, it's not only churches, even in the mosque, I also hear from synagogues and Hindu temples. If the pastors or the priests are telling extremism about other people, they say, hey, that guy is Christian guy, the Jewish guy, that Muslim guy, he's going to go to heaven, he's a good guy. What are you talking about nonsense? And the, the new generation is changing all that. And it will change. And also, uh, there was a survey taken in 1972. What is the way to salvation? 92% people said Jesus is the only way. Now that has declined to 62%. And this is among Christians. So there is a change coming. People are accept, as uh, Tim mentioned earlier, we're all converging towards pluralism, mm -hmm. our acceptance of each other. Margaret, God has created each one of us. God okay. didn't create you, me, and other people. If I don't accept a black person or a Jewish person or a Muslim or Hindu, then I'm telling God you screwed up. God cannot screw up. God does the right thing. He chose us to be different so we can learn to live with each other. If you look at anything in the universe, no snowflake is alike, no star is alike, no tree is alike. Every thumbprint of seven and a half billion people are different. Eye print is different, DNA is different. This is God's intention or those who don't believe its creators are the evolution's intention for all of us to have uniqueness. And that's what uniqueness is about. Hey, yeah, but it, it doesn't take everybody to do it. It takes a small group of determined people to do it. Exactly. That's what and Margaret so Media you, said. How do you come, you know? It also, the, the sheepish, the goats, the goats can be herded. Republicans sometimes yeah. at this time, at this time are acting like sheep. You, whoever can herd them can herd them. And uh, there were times I thought the Republican sheep were being herded in the right direction, but yeah. they turned back again. Trump had turned them back again. But when it goes to extremity, somebody will come along and correct the course. You cannot be wrong forever. 
Okay, Joseph, I noticed you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a question, please? Unmute, Joseph. Uh, Tim, yeah. I didn't know people still smoked. Uh, well, the problem <laughs> is, is it's, it's, I, I, I'm at my home and it's, I wouldn't be smoking in the restaurant. Got it. Thing. And it's just, it's just, it's a awful bad habit. I did quit for four months. I wouldn't encourage people to smoke, but. Uh, I'm, I, tempted, I'm tempted to, I'm tempted to go get a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, if you, if you Mike, if you want to smoke on, in front of us, I, I, we, I, you know, these no, no. guys know me well enough. Charlie smokes and. The problem is it's a nasty, filthy, disgusting habit. I got the patches and I, I just don't know how I, I quit for four months and it's just, I, let's just say I, I, I hate it. I like, <laughs> like it's just right, Romans 8, 28. Okay. I'll be at the very thing I do not that I hate. That okay. Habit. We'll just leave it there. Okay. All right. We're trying to save right. you, Tim. We're trying to save you. Yes. Amen. A lot of, <laughs> so is a lot of other people too, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I said, I, uh, no. uh, all right, Joseph, you had a question, so please go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> uh, I applaud you, Mike, for the great movement, um, ideas, courage, uh, and in engaging the enemy, uh, the way you do it. <clears throat> now, notwithstanding uh, all that great work, uh, resounding Margaret here, uh, divisiveness, white supremacy, etc., are on the rise. Um, in the contemporary socio-political okay, scenario of the big lie, what is the prognosis? How long will it take for a substantive change? Well, we were on the one extreme. And now uh, President Biden has toned down that rhetoric. At least the rhetoric it does not exist in the marketplace. Although it is fading among Republicans, but people like Marjorie comes back again and makes noise. Uh, but I'm, all, I'm always looking for the new generation, the people who are working in the White House. I live in Washington, D.C., Joseph. I am in touch with many staff members. And almost, I know, uh, I know two women friends who work for Mr. Trump, but they quit because they, they, had, they held very high positions. Uh, both of them are Indian Americans. They quit because they disagreed with his stance and issues. And uh, they tell me that, that many people, just because they have to take care of their families, they are working, otherwise they wouldn't be. But so there is a movement out there. Uh, but how strong, as you mentioned prognosis, I don't know, I have not done any study on that. I might look into that and uh, see what can be done about it. But the thing is, the we have to recruit the young people to bring about a change. Our gener next generation, we should quit poisoning our children. By that, I mean, if you have your child and it happens, look, that black person, don't trust him. He's Jewish, he's Hindu, he's a Muslim, he's a Christian, don't trust them. Even though the parents may not tell the child wrong about the other community, other race or ethnicity, the child absorbs it, it retains it. Now look at when I said, don't poison the children. What I meant is when that person grows up, when that person grows up to be uh, an adult, he has got, he or she has got to work among people of different faiths, races, ethnicities. Mm -hmm. He may not fully connect with them. He may not be productive to the employer. And when he goes, he, she, or he goes home, he is not fully in tune with them because he is obsessed with the hate for someone or the other from workplace or on the metro. So we have to quit from now on, at least the new generation. My son, 
I'm very happy to hear that I took my children, both my son and daughter, to every place of worship so they don't grow up to be bigots. Now, it is such a joy to see my son is taking his children to different places of worship. And not only that, he's taking them to different schools, different places where the children mix with the Asian, African-American, white, Jewish, Muslim children. And that way they don't grow up to be a bigots. And that is my vision for America as well as yours, where we can learn to accept each other because after all, we're Americans. Why? If I have a problem with you, if you take an apple, from me, that's the only apple I'm eating, then I'll fight with you. But if I am, I am not losing anything. If you worship any way you want to worship, how do I lose? You wear any clothes you want to wear, what is my loss? If I start thinking in those terms, would be a better place. And this is the thought we need to communicate to those people who are creating issues. Thank you, thank you. When I look at your movement and when I listen to you, uh, I am drawing a parallel here. Whatever you represent and um, raise up here uh, is nothing but the spirit of Christianity, what it used to be and ideally in action. Like uh, what Jesus would ideally do contemporaneously. But Christianity itself which was a larger movement, declined. So any thought on that uh, parallel I am making here? No, it's a good parallel. In fact, uh, that's what Jesus came to create. Came. But let me also add, whether Moses, Jesus, Abraham, Muhammad, Krishna, or anybody, they all came to do one thing, to create a society where everybody can live in harmony. That is their whole goal. They did not want anything. None of them were rich, they were rags, but they were committed to create better societies. And all societies, sometimes there is always a decline and a uprise again. Yes, the decline is there, but on the other hand, there are strong pillars in the community like yourselves who want to restore that goodness that Jesus taught. Okay, I know. Okay, I know. thank you, thank all you. Right. Uh, I think Raj and then Bob. So Raj, yes. go ahead. Uh, I have a question in that. Uh, when I see around, uh, people get more educated. They're getting more understanding of each other. Education is the most liberating thing in the world. And the second thing, I go to smaller community they are conservative. As they go to a bigger community, people see each other, they feel each other, they talk each other, and uh, they are getting better. Isn't it that's the way to go? Uh, that's a good point you mentioned, uh, Raj. Uh, you know, I can give you an example. When I was a little kid, I thought my mother's food was the best food in the world. Nobody can cook better than my mom. Then in high school, my friend and I shared the food, each other's food. All of a sudden, it dawned on me that my friend's mother also cooks good food, like my mother. Then we started eating in restaurant, going to the parties. Then we found that there is a good food all over. Our horizons simply expanded. As you mentioned, from a smaller group, the more people we meet, the more diversity we learn to see in opinions, our horizons expand, our... Uh, we become more universal. You made a very good point there. Okay. Um, anything else, mm -hmm. Raj? No, that's it. Okay, uh, Bob, go ahead and uh, ask, ask your question. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Mike, um, is, is there such a thing as homosexual marriage in the uh, Muslim world? And are there, uh, are there homosexual uh, imams or what, whatever they're called that, you know, yeah. It's clergy. The, the clergy is called Imam. In fact, there is a homosexual Imam right here in Washington, D.C. And there are several in Canada. And yes, there is homosexual marriage among Muslims. Homosexual has nothing to do with religion. 
people feel inclined towards appealing towards the same sex that is uh, that is their nature and it has nothing to do with religion culture or ethnicity or race it, does the does the quran specifically say anything for or against uh, homosexuality uh, in the in the you know in the, in the writings the quran and the bible has got the exact same text condemn god condemns the lewd behavior he doesn't condemn homosexuality in specific but he condemns lewd behavior uh, the prophet lot offers his daughters instead of the guys and uh, there is no condemnation but it is a cultural evolvement through there the quran doesn't specifically condemn uh, but it is interpreted as condemnation so i've heard of uh, homosexuals being beheaded in, in saudi saudi arabia that is correct that is wrong uh, quran says uh, that killing one human being is like killing the whole humanity you have no right to kill another life but they are doing it that is wrong and the government is killing that is wrong but who is there it's not about religion it is about their culture it has nothing to do with religion or islam it is a saudi culture because the muslims in india they don't kill the uh, homosexuals or even in pakistan they don't kill it was a, a final question as you're a little more familiar with this these things than i am uh do do, uh, do india and pakistan uh, for instance do they have a death penalty uh it's not practice it is there in uh, pakistan there's a, in both india and pakistan there is blasphemy and they call it sedition laws and the blasphemy laws mm -hmm. it was instituted by the british colonial empire in 1935 both the countries still have those laws on their books and, and, but, and there's a there's a death penalty for that yeah but it's not executed but india has changed now india for homosexuality is is openly accepted in india now it's legal now okay pakistan has not legalized india has legalized um you know Okay, who's next on the questions? Uh, Bob, we thank it. Now, Mike, I... I, I, um, I Charlie's I, got his hand up. Okay, Charlie, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please, Charlie. Yeah, Mike, uh, I'm a union organizer, and I have to deal, negotiate contracts with CEOs and company owners and... Uh, owners of businesses. And sometimes I have to submit claims uh, for thousands of dollars that they've cheated employees out of wages. They think nothing of it. And they think employees are, are won't do a lick of work if you don't watch them every minute. I'm wondering how in the world do, what is the Center for Pluralism? How do I deal with these individual how did what religion do i advance they have no religion at all except for profit except for the money yeah but if they i think if they can just go watch ask them to come and watch uh, as a test for a week how the workers do i'm sure there is one or two workers who are lazy but the majority of people don't do that and you cannot judge the whole group of people by the action of one or two and that's what you need to communicate to them. Okay, uh, Lana, do you have another question? Uh, not really. Thank you. Thank you so much. I saw your hand waving. That's why. Uh, no, I just Thank greeting uh, again. Say hello to Margaret. Didn't speak to her. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Mike. Um, you know, a lot of times. Um. You know, when I go to my uh, Christian faith, there, there is a sense that, you know, human beings with their free will and stuff have the propensity to do good and to do evil. Um, how do you deal with the problem of evil? Well, <laughs> God, cre God created the evil. God gave us the choice to choose between good and evil. And there is a punishment if you do the wrong, if there is a, a uh, reward if you do the right thing 
And I think um, as uh, we, the people who have some knowledge, what is wrong and right, we need to communicate to them. And uh, for they know not, we need to let them know how what it is. And uh, there is always going to be evil, Tim. The evil, God has created evil from the very beginning with the Satan. And uh, it is always going to be the temptations is going to be there. And uh, the larger society, the majority has to work towards pulling them back into the fold. But there is going to be always evil because always somebody is going to be uh, unjust towards some. It is the injustice that creates evil. If there is justice all around, uh, for example, corruption. I, I always have given this example for a very long time. Countries like Nigeria, India, and some of other countries, there is a huge corruption, uh, mainly because of the society is built up that way. There is not enough resources to, for everybody to share. In the United States, we're a land of plenty. So is Canada. There is no room for corruption. Although there is some, but not much. So it is got to do with resources. So you're saying that social inequity is, is lar one of the larger sources of evil? Absolutely. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, okay. Uh, I, I've got a, a ton more questions, but I'd like still, I want to hear from the rest of our audience. Um, and I know we've been getting a lot of good participation. Ada, you got it. Arlene, Ellen, Lawrence, uh, please join in. We've got still got some time left. And, um, you know, before we go to rebuttals, uh, Raj, you got a question, please come on in. Unmute Raj. If you got a question, Raj, unmute. Can, can you, uh, uh, Margaret seems to have a question. Okay. 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 I can, now you can hear me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Go, uh, ahead. go ahead, Raj. The, the, I, I have a, I have problem with the all religions. I mean, I mean, uh, because, uh, I mean, all of them are created 2000, 3000, 4000 years back. And uh, the innovations and change require it not happening. And uh, like it or not, uh, they have tremendous influence on, on a gauge on a, on a women's rights and you know so I mean why why are you taking a part through faith instead of uh, as a, as a, in general as open to without religion but as a as an issue of a society well religion is a dominant uh, uh, people is a dominant subject in the world. 90% of the people, uh, I'm sorry, 80% now of the population believes in religion. And it is that uh, you have to address them. Those who don't believe religion are fine, but those who believe in religion has to be addressed through their vehicle. And religions such as Raj are not bad. It is the misinterpretation that is bad. For example, I always give this example to my Muslim friends. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, go to Mecca. At that time, when, this, when this, somebody heard go to Mecca, or even during Jesus' time, if Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, people assumed they're riding a donkey or a camel. Now, if you tell these kids in the same town, Virginia, in Nazareth or wherever, uh, go to Jerusalem, they will think of flying or they think of driving. The, the item is same, the essence is same, travel, but the mode of transportation has differed. In religion, the essence is to create better society for all. That still remains the same, but the mode of operation has changed. And some people are stuck up with the old mode. They say, no, no, I have to ride donkey to go to Jerusalem. Fine, you go on donkey. But the majority of the people would like to drive car from wherever they are or fly. So the essence of religion is to create a society, cohesive society, where every human feels secure. That is the, that is the mission given to these assumed prophets or the people who assumed 
or took responsibility to create a better society. Everyone in your own group here, there is always going to be one moderator who brings peace. In any society you go, there is a peacemaker who brings peace. So are those prophets. The prophets are nothing but peacemakers who saw the fights, who saw the poverty, who saw the destitution, divisiveness. Uh, so they want to bring peace so everybody can live in peace. And so religion is not in itself bad. It's a good thing, but its interpretations are bad. Thank you. Okay, uh, who else is ready to uh, ask questions? I know um, I know we've been getting into some, some deep stuff. Peter, you, we gotta hear, oh, Bob, oh, please go ahead. Yeah. And then um, Charlie will go. Go ahead. Oh, Ellen, you wanna say know. something and then- Well, yeah, this... I don't know how, by the way, I don't know how to raise my hand on- it's okay. Go, then, go ahead. Okay. Right, go. Um, by the way, I'd just like to say, I think you're giving a very beautiful talk. And I'm very impressed. Um, I can see you're very much an optimist. Um, uh, just going back to, I think this is a little bit more of how to deal with difficult people. Um, so it might not be quite as relevant to this talk, but um, one of the one type of um, one group of people that I really have a lot of difficulty with is people who are uh, snobbish and who think they're superior. And there's quite a few of these people around, and they tend to not treat others so well. I mean, maybe people they think are in their crowd they treat well. And I mean, how do you? Um, how do you deal with these kind of people? I mean, sometimes these people are like, you know, in your family or whatever. Well, it's, uh, I took uh, my brother, my younger brother, when he, like you said, sloppy, he eats, he makes so much noise. He hits the spoon uh, on the plate, makes a lot of noise. When he eats the food, the mouth is open and the food is flying all over. I, it was very difficult for me for years. I couldn't understand. I tried to get him to eat with a closed mouth and all that. Then finally found out he had a problem with his mouth that he could not eat uh, with a closed mouth and uh, he couldn't hold the spoon firmly. That's why I was hitting it. Then when I understood the problem, I didn't have any more problems with him. And uh, I had to learn to accept his difference and uh, nobody has to be like me and uh, nobody has to eat like me dress like me why should they uh, i have a question if i may uh okay yeah um, then we'll go to we'll go to we'll go to lana and then charlie and then bob again okay very quick yeah very quick question if all right I may. peter well we'll put you on a list too okay sure thank you okay, all right so you. it'll be lana then charlie then bob and then peter mm -hmm. thank okay you. so go ahead lana so my question is, uh, did you ever attend it in Jewish, uh, in synagogue, in where you where you stay uh -huh. now, any services in synagogue? And I mean, I'm not talking about reform. Actually, whatever, like reform, whatever synagogue. Did you did you go to or not? I'm sorry. Your question was again. Again, my question is: Did you attend it any services in? your place where you're staying in Jewish synagogue, like- Yes, I did. You did? Yes, I reformed, both reformed. In fact, uh, to just to give you an idea, mm -hmm. there is a, a quiz at the uh, beliefnet.net. There is a quiz there, mm -hmm. and there are about 40 questions. If you answer the questions, it pops out. I am 92% pass for mm -hmm. reformed Judaism. Mm -hmm. I scored 92 on reformed Judaism. And uh, my highest score is universe, uh, Unitarian Universalist. I have scored 100 every time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other group, I'm trying to think, I get 96 on that one. Mm. So yes, I do attend synagogue. In fact, I wrote a beautiful eulogy for my friend who was the executive director of the Holocaust Museum in Dallas, uh, Ilian, Iliad, Iliad Glynn. He passed away and his body was shipped to Canada about eight or nine years ago. Yes, I do. I go to all places of worship. What I see is all of them 
uh, appreciating the creator, all of them acknowledging that there is some power higher than us, all of them acknowledging that we are all equal mm -hmm. people. So that is the same message we get in all places of worship. If you're good, the essence. Okay. All right. Uh, now I, I then, uh, 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 okay, Ellen went and then Lana went, uh, Charlie and Bob and then Peter. So Charlie, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mike, we had a regular for many years at the college, uh, Reverend Lee Hubble. And he said that Christianity was a very forgiving religion. And I asked him what he meant was, he said, if you read something in scriptures and you don't agree with it, simply turn the page ah. and you'll find the opposite. Now, Judeo-Christian religions and uh, the Muslim faith and Eastern religions to some extent are religions of the book. And they're very ill-defined ethical systems. You can find virtually anything in the literature of those religions. I mean, that's why you had a philosopher, Manu Kant, who said ethics should be based on a categorical imperative. There's one correct thing to do and one incorrect thing to do in any situation. Now, I don't understand if, if you even gave an example yourself, how in the Muslim faith you could come up with two answers to the same question. So how is, and the religions also try to establish a creed or doctrine even to eliminate there's 500 different Christian religions and several Muslim faiths and even several Buddhist religions. So how in the world do you ascertain any uh, sort of career what, guidance? What is the need? What is the need to, all of us have to be same. We have a different thumbprint, eye print and DNA is different. We are created to be unique. Why do we have to be equal? Why do we have to be like someone else? Why do we have to be copycats? We can be unique, but we have to learn to accept each other for who they are. Again, the same question goes, what difference does it, I'm sorry to use this, Hillary Clinton's famous question, what difference does it make if you worship a Jewish way, Muslim way or Hindu way, or I worship a Christian way, Buddhist way, what difference does it make to you? All you are doing is creating, worshiping the creator or acknowledging that there is someone greater than you and me. What's wrong with that? Why should one religion be better than the other? All religions, the essence is same in all religions. No religion is superior. As a Muslim, I'm going to claim that my religion, Islam, is not superior to any religion. If I claim my religion is superior, then I have not understood my religion. Religion is about humility that builds bridges. Arrogance is about creating conflicts. No matter who you are, whether you are Baptist, you are Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, if you think your religion is better than mine, you come and tell that to me, I said, go to wherever you want to go. My religion is better. It creates conflict. Religion is about humility, not arrogance. If I say my religion is superior, then I have not understood my religion, no matter what that religion is. I'm sorry to differ with everyone, but that's my belief. Um, okay, Bob, uh, go ahead. Okay, Mike. Um, um, there's a, a recent book out by uh, an author named Douglas Murray mm -hmm. called... Um, I think it's called the the, uh, the madness of crowds, and his uh, theory is that this current wokeness that we're uh, experiencing throughout the world is really a, a new religion that is, uh, you know, being filling the vacuum by the basically the death of the, the all the great religions, you know, the, you know Christianity and 
uh, Islam and Judaism. I was wondering if you uh, kind of, uh, if you buy, buy into that uh, and, uh, and if you can see some parallels that like, because it gives the, the people these, the, you know, I'll call them the wokesters for lack of a better term. Uh, the, you know, they, they're driven by this, uh, you know, like a religious zeal for utopia to reach utopia and we're just we're always a few trillion tax dollars away from reaching utopia if we would just give the government more money and we could have all the all the education and the oh we could lift the the black people out of poverty and the world out of poverty oh we'd have a we'd have a green future without nuclear energy and blah 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 uh, it, don't you think that uh, Douglas Murray is right? Isn't this all this wokeism? Isn't this just a really basically a, a new religion? And I should add, besides all that stuff, or also the religion of collectivism versus what this country was founded on, which is individualism, uh, you know, if, and free markets. Okay, I'll shut up and let you let you answer. Well, if it gains popularity, like Jesus has got two. Uh, two trillion, uh, sorry, two billion, some followers. Muhammad has got some followers. Hindus have that followers. If this guy woke, has got some kind of followers, then it becomes a solid movement. If not, it is just a thought. And again, every thought has begun somewhere and has grown into a big movement. If it makes sense, it will gain cre credibility. Well, it will gain uh, momentum. If not, it will die down. There as are a, many such movements. Kind of as a follow-up here, um, um, doesn't it appear that this uh, new, uh, you know, all this new wokesterism, isn't this just really just thinly veiled Marxism? Uh, I'm not sure about that. It sounds like it, but I'm not, I have not read the book. Okay. Um, all right. Anyone, anything else there, uh, Bob, or not? Because uh, we are Peter Perro was next. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, go ahead and ask your question. Well, I'm really encouraged by Mike's presentation, especially the comments about the younger generation now, that they seem to be more tolerant um, in a multicultural world, uh, rejecting uh, many old religious orthodoxies and uh, they are more critical thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with that idea and I hope they, they can manage the next generation beyond us. Um, Amen. Talk, yeah, Amen thanks, to that. Uh, I, I uh, am a high school teacher and I, I've done many things over the years to uh, try to expand their purview of, of the world. Uh, we brought in and exchanged students from suburbs into our city school, and uh, it seemed to work very well. They were quite open to each other, even though um, sometimes the language blocked blocked some of the communication. Uh, I found that the uh, suburban students were embracing the uh, Latino students, and I was really encouraged by that, although we still have gang problems in our in our city. Peter. Yes. Yeah. Peter, let me add to that. I officiate uh, interfaith weddings. Weddings That's between Jews and Muslims, Christians, Hindus, mm -hmm. every possible combination. You know what yeah. gives me the most joy? Once the main ceremony is over, all the kids are on the floor, black, white, Asian, Chinese, Korean, Indian, uh, you name it. They're all dancing on the floor with mm -hmm. no differences. It's such sure. a, I wish, I suggest you to attend some of those youth weddings and you will just enjoy sitting in a corner and seeing these people enjoying themselves without any barriers. That is the America that's going to happen soon. I think so. Uh, what else could we do? I mean, beyond these school exchanges, I noticed more students in college are into uh, work, study, study abroad, uh, summers and, and uh, service work is an important component now uh, for graduation in the high school. Uh, more students studying languages at, 
what else could be done with these students? Uh, we don't want to make them pessimists. We do want to give them some reasons for optimism, but uh, they don't believe much in the political system that exists right now or the two-party system, and uh, I don't blame them. What else? I like what you said about your exchange and your, your wedding uh, ideas. Anything else we could be doing with these kids? As you mentioned, taking them to other houses of worship and... <laughs> your city, Chicago, has got by a guy by the name Ibu Patel. I'm sure you heard about him. <laughs> what no, he does, mm -hmm. Ibu Patel is a big name from Chicago. What he does, he's a young man. I think he's about 40 or 45. He started a similar parallel movement like I did. Uh, he takes children from four or five different faiths and takes them to fix a synagogue that is torn down or that is in disrepair, a Hindu temple. And he takes them to practical places to sit down and eat together, do oh. things together. When you get to know each other, conflicts fade and solutions emerge. It is only when you don't know the other person. You got myths about Fair Jews, enough. about Muslims, mm -hmm. about Christians, about the blacks. When you see them, when you sit down with them for half a day and talk to them about different issues, you find commonalities all in a sudden. And that's what Ibu Patel is doing. You oh. might want to look into Youth Interfaith Initiative, I believe. Uh, check it out. Uh, you might want to join and help him out, expand his work. All right, that's a good idea. And uh, music, food ways, yes. uh, dance, these kind yes. of things are bridges to understand. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your encouragement. I leave tonight more encouraged and optimistic. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Well, you want to conclude the program now, Tim or Charles? Well, well, Joseph's got one more uh, question. Okay. We'll All take right. the last question. We'll move into rebuttals then. All right. And then what that what that part is, is that each and every everybody have like two to three, maybe four minutes of what they want to say. Okay. And if you want to stick around, go ahead, because you'll get the last word. But uh, oh, well. let's, let's, let's let Joseph have this last thing. If you need to go, we can understand. No, no, oh. I, can, I can hang out. All right, Joseph, uh, your last question. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Mike, uh, I guess you are appealing to the goodness of um, humans in talking to the enemy. And you say that using the religion uh, is like using a worker. Now, the issue is uh, religions also have some stigma attached to them. Um, a lot of divisive people uh, use a religion as vehicle too. Uh, my case in point would be um, our last president. Uh, so I wonder, why do you bring a religion to the mix? Uh, can you have your message or modus operandi secular is religion necessary yes this is the good point if you go with secular most only some people get it a majority of the people are still follow one religion or the other i think 80 percent of americans follow some religion in some shape or form we will miss out the majority if you stick to the secular but the secular people are secular enough to understand religious point of view. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, I guess we'll now get into a rebuttal period, which means you'll each get a set amount of time to uh, do it. Now, who has rebuttals tonight? Um, that means, uh, Raj, I know you got one. Uh, let me get a list here real quick. Hang on a second, let me get pen and paper. Um, I know, uh, okay. we'll start with Raj and then um, I don't know where he went off to, but I think he's got one. Who else has a rebuttal tonight? Raj? Yes, I said yes. Okay. I've, got a, I've got a rebuttal too. And Margaret? Okay, who else? 
I know Charlie. Uh, this already. is Ellen. This is Ellen. I have a rebuttal. Okay, Ellen. Uh, Charlie, I know you always have one. I always know you want to go last. I I'm not going to rebut tonight because I pretty much um got my stuff out with the questions. Bob, you want to rebut tonight too as well? I, I probably will after uh, I have a little time to, to digest all this. Okay, and so uh, anybody else? We have Lawrence, Ada, Arlene, Ellen. Um, I know I got one Ellen and I think Dan and Leanne, if you guys want to go. Okay. Uh, seeing as how we got some time, I'll give everybody five minutes. It'll be Raj, Margaret, Ellen, Charlie, and then Bob. Um, so uh, Raj, go ahead. You got five minutes is yours. Uh, say what you want to say and let's get right to it. Uh, I've got a clock uh, over here in my other uh, computer. So Mike, thank you. Mike, thank you. You did a good job. And whatever you are doing, I don't agree 100%, but I think uh, like in India, we say that uh, good people descend from heaven and India and they descend to India. And so I'm glad you are doing something. Uh, faith, I'm not a faith person, but I go to Catholic church and uh, uh, an Indian temple. And I have I have been to mosque and and almost every everything. When I came to America, uh, the, I was very surprised on a campus that there was people lots of there were very religious people like Mormons there in Utah. And so I made I made and I wanted to go into politics there. So I made a point to introduce myself to Catholic Church, Mormon Church, Protestant Church, and uh, so. That particular issue I neutralize. I do believe in a religion different way. Uh, when I go there, I see people, it is religion, going to church, going to mosque, going to synagogue, is a refuge and shelter for lots of people. Lots of old people come there. You know, they, they are not in, they are not interested in other things, but but uh, but they believe that they are doing good thing and it makes them feel good. You know, Catholic Church, I can I can virtually fail it because I sit back of the back of the church and I can watch everybody. And yeah. it's a great. The the in terms of as I, I said before that as people will know, get more educated and they'll know each other, things will get better. Okay. But uh, the where, where we have problem is that, that how do we get people educated? How do you get people access to communication? Right now, lots of people, lots of poorer people, lots of minority people, they do not have access. You know, lots of people do have computers, but uh, they cannot go to many places. You know, lot, lot, lots of places or they do not know. And so, it is important to know that how how do we how do we do this? How do you create a better world for them? And uh, how do you create? Just you say a couple of things that that Indian guy in Chicago and uh, what you are doing, the meeting different people and getting them together. I I, I think it's it's a, it's a very nice. I'm I, I'm concerned about. Uh, uh, I'm a Democrat, and. Uh, Partially happy, partially unhappy, and uh, the the I realized that the church churches are a big influence in this country and any other country, and uh, and I like to do something about that, particularly in in terms of what is hate going on, and uh, but I, I should say one thing before that, that Republicans are I hate to say Republicans because lots of Republicans are very very good people. In my life, Republicans help me more than Democrats because the Republicans, they, they come down to helping me. If I ask for help, they'll help me. Democrats, they will go to, they will go to reform the world. <laughs> and, 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 and it's important, important difference that, that when I go ask for help, I want help, okay? And Democrats have not learned that. Democ Democrats are going to reform the whole world and and and, uh, and that is a problem but uh, we we need a lot of innovation how we try to tackle the change the world and it's not going to work it's not going to work like uh, 
in a way of these parties are doing. If a church is there we, you know, on, on, a, on a women's right issue or a homosexual issue, and I, in my neighborhood, the ch churches don't, the all churches in, in my area, in a, in a lake view, churches are except homosexuals. They, they, they welcome them. They openly welcome them. They advertise there they, in their public relations. Okay, so that's nice. But how do we how do we do it? It is going to confront them, confront them in a church, inside the church. Go and ask them a question, uh, or, or or say, hey, why this is this? And uh, we we have to do some something innovative that uh, message goes straight straight to them, and they feel the burden they feel the people are asking the question because most churches they don't teach anything values you know they are, they, are, they go to bible and they say this thing this thing this thing and it innovation is the most important thing you know and, and, and communication how to communicate to people who disagree with us and often it's, a, it's a contentious i was in new york city and i was in a clothing business and clothing business anywhere you go there he said, how can anybody not like Raj? But <laughs> when I came to Chicago and I found out that, uh, well, you know, some people can hate me too, you know, and, and that, that is a reality. Anyway, anyway, whatever you are doing is good and I hope you keep on doing it. And I hope it brings something good to the world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Okay, Raj. Uh, Margaret, you wanted to go next, so please. Uh... Yeah, um, I just would like, to uh, tell Mike that the, the latest polls, or at least the ones that I saw a few months ago, show that only 75% of people, um, I'm only, God, 25%, uh, approximately 25% of people don't acknowledge any, re any religious identification. So the, the you know, it, it keeps getting smaller. Thank you. Um, anyway. Um, I, I really, what your approach seems to be one of the few that, that offer any hope for us. And um, I'm an old lady, I'm 74. And so I um, don't think I'm gonna live long enough to see it work out really well, because it takes a long time. I read about that gentleman who uh, made friends with the clan with a, with a grand dragon or something. And the guy actually resigned his <laughs> if I remember correctly. And, yes. and it, it really literally took years for this to happen. But he was patient, but I am not. So there you go. And the other thing that, that I, I, um, I appreciate your interpretation of religion, but once you get a religion in an institutional position, then it loses all of that. It's uh, it's on its own self process that it um, it's it's concerned with its own survival and nothing else and power and accumulating power and property and money and all that and certainly that's been the history of the Catholic Church throughout the centuries and it was it is most assuredly the history of the Catholic Church in the United States um, the. Uh, the, the the American Council of Bishops have been extraordinarily reactionary. They um, they want women to be barefoot and pregnant. Um, they don't care that a maternal mortality rises when you make abortions illegal. They don't uh, that you know women die because of the things that they're doing. They are uh, reject um, you know love this love the sinner but not the sin, which is the just bullshit um, in terms of, of, of what's going on. And, and, even, and you have Catholics for dignity or whatever that, you know, that people want to stay in that social group. They really do. But, you know, that, that group doesn't care. That group wants their power and they want to control people. They want to control their sexual behavior. That, and this, the, the, the Christian, well, all, all religions are, are like that, that they want to control your sex, your sexual behavior, you know, because if you can make people think about what's in the nether regions as opposed to what's going on around them, then you got them because they're not paying attention to anything else. 
So I, you know, I think religions are divisive. They always have been. They've been utilized by the people in power as a way of reinforcing conservatism in society and reinforcing um, the, the, um, the, the control of whoever's in power and it, it's used as, as like that. And, and I mean, Machiavelli really is, is one of the people who really defined that, but it was defined before that. So it was noted before that. And this, I don't know, you know, free will and, and all that stuff. I mean, they call the study of, of the, who, who is God if he's all knowing and all powerful and all merciful and whatever and all this crap goes on. You know, that's called theodicy. And as far as I'm concerned, it's idiocy. So at any rate, religions were not founded in peace. They've been instruments of war. They have def uh, supported in, um, supported all kinds of horrible things like slavery and the, and the oppression of women and all that other stuff. So, you know, I'm a little leery of religion. I appreciate your definition of it. Mm. I really think that, and you are a few out of the many. The many support all of these traditional interpretations of what's going on. So that's my comment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Ellen, you want to go next since you're on the list? Uh, go ahead. You got um, your word. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I Wish we could see you. enjoyed it. Yeah, Excuse me? See. Wish we could, Wish we see, could you. see you. Yeah, Ellen. Oh. If, if you don't mind. Well, oh, well, I'm not, sh I don't know. I seem to be having some problem with my, um, with the video. Okay. On my Zoom. I don't know if, why it doesn't work anymore while it used to. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Okay. For some then, unknown then, reason. Then what, um, but anyway, um, <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to, you know, thank you for your presentation. Um, I didn't agree with everything you said. Um, I'm also from the more secular camp. And, um, but it, it, I mean, um, I do think it was nice for you to talk about some of the, the verses from the Quran and from the Bible and the things that Jesus says um, and, I mean, I do think it's it's nice to get people so that they're not fighting over religion. Um, I don't think we're going to eliminate it, it eliminate it in our society, nor should we, you know, you know, be like the communists and try to, you know, oppress people into not having a religion. Um, so, since there's always going to be religion, you know, yeah, it's good to get people together and of different um, faiths and different, um, also also get them together with secularists because I, there is, I think there is prejudice against people who are secular. Um, and I think, um, I don't know, I, 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 I certainly felt that. Um, but, you know, I think some of your ideas are really great. Um, the idea of listening to people you disagree with um, and trying to find commonality to try to get specific about what they um, what they think and and um, what their issues are with maybe the way that you think about things. Um, I mean, what I find in our society is that we have a lot of people who are so busy criticizing, condemning, um, labeling, um, stereotyping and being angry at other people who they disagree with, that um, it, it's it's not very productive. Um, it, it's it's kind of like the opposite of listening to them and seeing how they view and perceive the world and looking for commonalities. And also it can be pretty counterproductive for even finding solutions, you know, like, if you're upset at a family member and all you do is criticize about how horrible they are about a certain issue, that you might be so busy doing that you don't that'll that you'll overlook 
um, a solution to the problem. There might be a solution to the problem, to something that they're doing that's irritating you, but you'll never come at it because you're so busy being critical of them. Um, but um, um, one thing I have discovered, you know, is, you know, I used to always, you know, consider myself a real liberal. And, um, but then I started, you know, I, I do have certain people in my life who are more conservative. And then, you know, I started, you know, people used to tell me, oh, Fox News is all just lies. Um, and then I started listening to some of it, selected amounts, and some of it, you know, I really super disagree with. And then there are other things where they have some good people. They have some really good people um, on Fox News. They have um, that famous fe feminist, I forgot her name, oh. um, Gloria Steinem, perhaps. Um, they have yes, Lang Greenwald, they have um, Tulsi Gabbard which she often says good things. So, I mean, it's not like I'm a conservative, but I mean, um, I don't think these people are even espousing conservative views. Um, they're just uh, different views. And then I've also learned that some of the um, left-wing um, media outlets are doing a lot of lying themselves. So, I mean, to just totally, not look at both sides and to just discount um, other groups and other people saying different things when you know nothing of, really about what they're saying. I used to never listen to anything on Fox News because somebody just told me they lie. Well, some of them do probably and some of them don't. You know, just like the liberal media, there's a lot of lying there and there's truth telling, I'm sure as well. Um, I also wanted to um, say that, you know, I love that example you gave about like um, the gun toting people who went to the um, mosque and wanted to be threatening or they were planning on going to the mosque, but then they put out water for them. Um, I just think that's really like kind of a beautiful idea because I think that you're right. If, if we just um, dig in our heels um, and call other people enemies. We're not going to come at to common ground and we're not gonna have any peace. Um, so I think while I'm not as optimistic as you are, I think, um, you know, I think your organization is doing some really good things. And um, thank you for the presentation. Okay, um, next is Charlie, unless Bob wants to go before Charlie. Okay, uh, all right, Charlie, let go Bob ahead. Go. Let Bob go, I'll go last. Bob, if you're ready, let's go. Okay, okay. well, uh, Mike, thanks for your uh, speech tonight. I found it uh, actually quite interesting. Um, as much as I hate to agree with Margaret on anything, I do I do have to, uh, you know. We've got a pluralistic I, moment coming here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm also, uh, I, I'm an atheist. Um, and I was, you know, uh, you know, baptized Catholic, but I was not really raised as a very strict Catholic. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I became an atheist, gosh, I think in the fourth grade. Um, and then I, uh, I became more and more of a, of a vociferous atheist. I mean, what they would call an anti-theist probably peaking around the time when, uh, when the, uh, new atheist movement was really rolling with the, with the, uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens and, uh, and, uh, Dawkins and, uh, Richard ha or, or Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> but, uh, but that, uh, but I've actually, as I've gotten older, I've actually toned down my rhetoric and actually became a little more, um, tolerant of religion. And I'll, I'm, and I'm willing to remain tolerant as long as you know like as long as there's there's no violence uh you know people using religion as a an excuse for violence uh that, that i can't go along with but i mean if you know if people you know want to do their own religious thing i mean i'm basically uh, also you know i was also uh, be, also became a libertarian over that time 
and uh, adopted a, a much more, you know, you know, la hands off or laissez faire, you know, view of things, thinking you know, if, you know, whatever. If it doesn't, hurt, you know, people are free to do what they want to do until they, you know, you know, uh, until they, uh, you know, step on, you know, my freedoms. But um, uh, even now, though, uh, now I'm even starting to question some of my libertarian beliefs. Um, like, like, for instance, like with, uh, you know, with gay marriage and, and, and that for a while, I, you know, I mean, early on, I thought, well, that's, you know, I, I'm really, I don't like the government really being involved in, in really anything other than the three, you know, than the three uh, purviews of government, which should be uh, police, military, and, in, and enforcing contracts in the courts. That's really about all the government should be doing. So I thought, well, let's keep the government out of things like marriage and all that let people do what they want to do. But then it seems to me though, that there's once, once we get, once they got gay marriage in now, all of a sudden, now we've got all this transgender nonsense going on and all this fluidity, this gender fluidity and, you know, pronouns and all that stuff. And now I'm thinking, <clears throat> I think, and I have to say, I, it seems to me those, those people are just, um, you know, they, they have a mental health problem. And uh, I, you know, and I see them all over the place on the internet, you know, TikTok and all that, you know, they're, they're, they're teachers now. And, you know, then there's the, the you know, men in, in, in participating in women's sports, which is ruining, ruining, you know, women's sports and opportunities for, for, for real women. And uh, I'm thinking now that I think maybe I might've made a mistake abandoning you know some, some of the moral certainties that were offered by some of the religions like you know there is a man and a, you know, there are two sexes a man and a woman and marriage it should be the uh sacred you know bond between two of them you know for purposes of you know raising a family and that and that's it maybe i'm thinking we should maybe go back to that i'm thinking it's you know that wasn't such a bad thing but i see how everything's gotten so totally weirded out now so uh so that's one thing and um uh the other thing on uh with with uh, re regards to uh, changing attitudes as you age and become more tolerant and stuff i i always thought that uh you know the idea of abortion it never really set with me right because it, it seemed to me like it it cheapened life and i was always thinking back to the holocaust and uh you know, how, you know, you know, that we could actually have, you know, instant, you know, government institutions coming along and, you know, industrializing and mechanizing, you know, murder you know, and genocide. And uh, so that I kind of thought that way. And then, but of course, all the, you know, with, with the, the liberal media and the force, of course, the taking over of our schools and academics and everything by Marxism, uh, well, the Marxists, that's, you know, of course, all I heard in school and growing up and in college and everything was how, you know, abortion was the, you know, the sacred right that for women and all this problems you'd have, you know, all this, uh, you know, you're destroying women's lives if they, if you don't allow them to kill their babies and blah, blah, blah. And now I'm thinking, well, you know what, you, you, when you look at a, uh, you look at some moral uh, certainty, like in the constitution, there is nothing in the constitution that says you have a right to uh, murder your baby. Uh, it says, you know, the constitution is supposed to guarantee life liberty and the pursuit of happiness so right there life that's the very very first thing and how can you have human rights if you're you know killing humans and i started looking at the some of the actual statistics and again what you hear from uh you know the the, the left and the mainstream media which is basically just the you know the, the uh you know propaganda arm of the left is that uh oh but what about the, you know the incest and rape and you know mothers of life and you know in danger and blah 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 well it turns out that those are just really infinitesimally small examples um you know it's that's that's like you know one one percent of of the abortions uh, so i'm thinking uh, maybe uh i would be willing to go along with restricting abortion if somebody gets raped or has incest, they can take an abortion pill the night after, uh, you know, and get rid of it. Uh, 
you know, that way. Um, and if, of course, if there's, you know, if the well, uh, welfare of the mother is, is in question, if she deliver, you know, has the, has the pregnancy, well, then I would say that that would be acceptable then in that case. But uh, I think maybe we've had too much, too much big government being our nanny and solving all of our problems for us. And if that was taken away, maybe people would be a little more responsible in their actions and uh, take, take precautions. All right, Bob. Um, thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. I let you go a couple extra minutes. Charlie, you're okay. next. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's thank our speaker, Mike. Thank you very much for a, uh, a actions on your organization and your talk, your presentation, uh, the insights that you've given us tonight and the work of your organization towards bringing people together. That certainly is a commendable activity. I have a uh, about four things that I will eclectically speak about. Number one is uh, uh, Margaret mentioned uh, some aspects of religion uh, causing difficulties in the world. My very first meeting of the College of Complexes, uh, a guy gave a lecture on how the Catholic Church had started through Cardinal Spellman of New York he was responsible for the war in Vietnam. So religion, I learned, uh, causes wars uh, uh, to be undertaken on their behalf. Uh, the second thing is regarding Fox News. Uh, the only reason Fox News has left these are liberals on their programming schedule they are to use them as props. Uh, they have no other intention than utilitarian exploitation. They are not looking towards presenting objective news or an analysis. They're simply props that they can later on uh, 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 criticize in various fashions. It's a standard format. Uh, anybody has invitations to go on, you know that that's it. The only reason they're looking for you is uh, as a prop, like a theater prop. Uh, let's see, the other thing about religion, uh, I've always been suspect about any of the world's religions uh, being a, a guide towards ethical behavior, since some of them apparently, why don't they condemn slavery? Why, why, why wouldn't, wouldn't that come to mind? Like if you were gonna write an ethical code, wouldn't that be kind of, I mean, yesterday was Human Rights Day. Uh, there's actually, there's very little discussion, by the way, of human rights in scriptures. I don't know about the Quran, but it isn't, it isn't, it does not exist. The concept of human rights came about by secular, secular humanists uh, much later. And uh, there's no rough, no discussion. They read scriptures from a perspective of human rights. You won't find anything uh, regarding it whatsoever. Now, regarding gender, we had a speaker at the college, and none of us could ascertain the precise gender of the speaker. We were asking among ourselves, and the topic was gender and so forth. Uh, we weren't certain if it was a woman trapped in a man's body or something, but there's no reason to believe that gender is precise and one or the other. That's not the case in nature. And to impose that standard is not reflecting the reality of what takes place in the world. That's all I know about gender is that it is not as precise or set or established as perhaps some religious authorities would like you to believe. Now, last of all, there's two kinds of religious conflicts, two kinds. You have interconflicts, I-N-T-E-R, and that's one religion versus another, interdenominational conflicts. Actually, those aren't too severe or very often. They have that warfare and conflicts, but I am inter 
inter interreligious warfare. Now, the one kind of religious conflict that really, really gets heated is intra, I N T R A. And that means within one religion, disputes regarding the doctrine. And that's where they start declaring people heretics. And for some reason, I'm not precisely certain why, those can be rather stringent uh, affairs. That's intra religious conflicts. And that's where you came up with the concept of heretics and imposition of penalties such as excommunication. So that's just something to keep in mind regarding this. Anyhow, thanks a lot, Mike. I enjoyed your talk and I applaud your efforts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Um, if there, are there any more rebuttals? If not, we'll let Mike uh, take the last word. And uh, Mike, you got the last word on everything. <laughs> well, Raj had mentioned he was a faith person and uh, he, he believes through education, things can be changed. I agree with him. And Margaret, when she corrected me on one item, she mentioned about 25% of people are non-religious, which uh, is an improvement. It used to be 20%. And uh, Ellen mentioned open to secular societies, finding commonalities. And Bobby had mentioned about moving from atheist, from vociferous atheist to moderate toned down atheist, I kind of like that. And uh, he also moved towards libertarian, which I have moved through as well. But I wish he agrees, at least he uh, develops a moderation attitude towards uh, LGBT community as well. Uh, that's all I can pray. Uh, Charles, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, intrafaith, conflict is more severe than the interfaith conflict. And that has definitely given rise to excommunication and all the other things that you mentioned about it. I just want to thank you all for participation. And I have learned so much through your comments. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Mike for participating at this point. Now we're gonna close out the official proceedings at the College of Complexes, but we'll keep the window open for any off uh, off comments. So thank you all for attending and this will conclude the College of Complexes for tonight. <laughs>